Adrian killing Africa shows you how uh, a lot of times people believe that everybody in Africa is doesn't have uh, education. Africans are the most educated people who get here. In the United States, they are known to be the group that has the highest level of education, right. more than Europeans and more and more than uh, even uh, uh, the uh, Asians. So we know that our people are intelligent. They've been doing that, going to Harvard in the uh, 1900s or the 1800s. So we know that. But what we really have to, have to know that we can no longer afford for our people to come here and get caught up in this making money for the capitalist system so that they don't go back to do what they were supposed to do in the first place. And then people in Africa say, what happened to us? You know, we must not be able to make it because nobody came back. Thank you. I just wanted to follow that up with three quick things. One, I've heard it over and over and over, and every time you've been given an actual place to go and a reference, read. It is not just fundamental, it is liberating. Read. You can find this information and discern this information for yourselves. And under that same self-help note, my sister, I would also say, you can organize yourself to go. You know, when I first started going, we would sit around with just my sisters and say, we want to go, we got somewhere to go and something to do, and how are we going to do it? And we would collectively raise our money, we would collectively do our cultural research, we would collectively train ourselves in who and how we needed to be so that we were not the ugly Americans that, yes, even black folk tend to be when we travel. And then the third thing is, is that make sure you already have some level of connection with where you are going before you get there. Because the door of welcoming is already waiting to welcome you. You just have to say, hey, I'm coming. So that's also important, and again, I tell you, take yourself to serve, don't just go to see. Excuse me, um, may I make a comment on that? I think we've been given two assignments, at least two, I think there are more. Uh, one, um, Otep, um, may I ask permission again to speak from my elders? I'm sorry. <laughs> I am Sister Kua Monica Collins. Um, we've been given two assignments. I remember in 1960, in 1986, when we were at a conference of ASCAT in New York, Dr. Ben got up on stage. I don't think he meant to do it, but he got up and he said, I'm taking you to Kemet next year for an affordable price. Would you believe it? 800 of us went to Kemet the next year, and 400 additional people showed up in Kemet from around the world. We took 800 as ASCAT but 400 additional, 1,200 of us plus, arrived in Aswan, Egypt, for a conference about this very thing we are speaking. That's almost 20 years ago. We now have an assignment to go to help Zimbabwe. We now have another assignment to go and help Ghana. We have another assignment to go and help Sierra Leone. We have another assignment to go and help quite a few, no, there are quite a few crisis areas, all right? So these are our assignments. When are we going to, to do that? Yes, my name is Brother Kwame Lumumba. I'm also one of the co-conveners of the Million Small Movement along with my sister. Um, I have um, three questions. The first question is um, directed to any of the panelists. What do you feel about the um, concept of dual citizenship for African people in the diaspora. Yes. The, the other is, how can we formulate an official, um, some official representation for people in the diaspora on the African Union, in the African Union? And third director, particularly to Brother Akbar, if uh, he could possibly tell us about Ghana's campaign known as the Josephs um, in Ghana to the audience. Okay, I mentioned this earlier, I don't know if you were here, uh, brother. Uh, there are countries that grant delegations, dual citizenship, you get a passport. It's just that I lived in Ghana so long that I got one just by living there. And uh, I was tight with the then head of state. But what the key is that we have to work on the African Union with this sixth region that we want to get, we want number one, 
We want the African Union to give us passports for all 53 African nations. Yes. And uh, so that passport would be the diaspora. And then we could use that to move in and out of any African country. Believe me, that's the way to go. You lobbying with the parliament in Ghana, and they going back and forth, we'll give you right of a bow, and uh, we'll give you this status. You don't want none of that. That's a waste of time. Then I got to go to the Gambia, then I got to go to Sierra Leone and ask for one, I got to go to Egypt, and all of that. The African Union is the key. We're Africans in the diaspora, and we want a passport. That's it, okay? Yes, yes. This, the third question that you asked was, brother, could you repeat that last question? Um, I, I was talking about the campaign the uh, government Joseph. has now known as the Joseph. Okay, the Joseph Project. The Joseph Project is, is real simple. Uh, those of you who still read the Bible or, or in the Bible or out of the Bible, but you know the story of Joseph, and my brother repeated it here. Joseph stole into bondage by his brothers. Joseph goes into Egypt. He gets the learning of the Egyptians. Joseph ends up with the key to the granary and he comes home to feed his father and his brothers in a time of famine. There's famine of know-how on the African continent. They're sincere, but they don't have as many people who are technically astute as we have in America. We built this country and they need to now open a way for this Joseph to come back home with the key to management and building their societies. And that's what Ghana is trying to implement as the gateway to Africa. As a part of our reparations demand and um, in uh, opposition to homeland security, uh, we have collective security. And in that, as a part of our reparations demand, it should be that um, if we, as an option, that we want to return to our homeland or what, whom, whatever a part of Africa that we designate, this should be a part of our reparations demand. Is the open invitation as well as a, uh, a visa or whatever certification that we need, this should be a part of our reparations demand. Also, I would like for us to be conscious that when the minister Lamptey was in Israel recently, the Project Joseph is a prophetic fulfillment. You see, we're leaving the prophecies out of this. It's not gonna be an economic solution. I mean, we've been fighting for economic empowerment and talking about it for years, but where are the results at? So now it's a paradigm shift. We now have spiritual power against all of those different agents on the continent. And this is a beginning. Ghana wants to have the, her children come back and her children that want to come back, that's why I stated, those that voluntarily want to return will return. There are many of our people yet not interested in returning to the continent. We have to be honest about that. When I first went to Ghana, West Africa, from Israel, in 1976 on assignment, I was teaching in the Volta region, in the villages, as well as later in Accra in some of the schools and churches. The first question I was asked, does Africa have a God? And they didn't know, like many of us never knew, that from the first chapter in Genesis, you're reading about our beloved continent. It wasn't named after no European. The continent was named by God Almighty, Eden. We are an Edenic people, but they had to change the image of the continent to make us not want to identify with it. But the Joseph Project is the beginning. And we have to support it. There are many of us that want to support it. You can contact us at Soul Vegetarian Restaurant. We have been on the continent for 40 years next year. We also want you to know that Israel is Northeast Africa. That's why they make this political map and they cut Israel off and stop at Egypt. But that doesn't change it because the boundary lines of the land of Israel, biblical boundary lines, is from the river of Egypt, the Nile, all the way to the Euphrates. The war in Iraq is a war of destabilization. It was announced three years ago when the war first began 
Our anointed spiritual leader, Ben and me, called us together in a nation meeting and declared this will be a war of destabilization. And the great fear is the alignment of us. Everyone is looking up in the sky. Mars is aligned with Jupiter. That's not the important alignment. The important alignment is us coming together. On, this is what they fear, us coming together. Thank you. Uh, greetings, my name is Afua. My questions uh, are to three members of the panel, um, to Professor Jeffries and to Professor Small. They held workshops on Friday on, in three areas, politics, economics, and culture. My question to you is, which do you place the most importance and why? as it relates to us as African people. Question number two, uh, to the sister on the end sitting next to Professor Jeffries, Mama Jones, I'd like to hear in your opinion, are our women adequately represented in the struggle, in your opinion? Is it age before beauty? <laughs> she made that determination by calling you first. I'll leave her off. Okay, brothers and sisters. It's good to see you out there. <laughs> um, and it's good to have this type of forum. I'm reminded of watching C-SPAN last week with Tavis. Smiling <laughs> at Cornell, pontificating. So it's good to see Africans taking control and laying out their future. The question is like this Is it more important, or which is more important? My heart? <laughs> My mind or my behind? <laughs> and to be frank, you've got to have them all. Ain't none of them more important than that. If your mind ain't right, you can't, there's nothing that's going to be right. If your heart ain't working, ain't nothing. If your behind ain't poop, you're going to get stacked up with, backed up with. We need a system of analysis. A paralysis of analysis has to focus on one thing, or personality, or a circumstance, or an episode. Systems analysis allows you to look at the whole picture, to see the interconnection of things, relate, relating to your past, your present, and your future. Economics is the first principle. Economics is your productive capability. Nothing happens unless you have an economic and productive capability. Every living thing has to have an economic and productive capability. But that economic and productive capability has to be managed. So you have to have your management capability kick in, and management, the management capability is your politics. Politics is not what politicians do. Politics is what you do to control your life, your family, your community, your world. So economics and politics are the foundation for anything that we do. Productive capabilities linked up with management capabilities. But if your culture is not correct, right. then you won't do your economics in your interest and you'll do your politics with any devil who's available to do it. Culture lets you know who to do your economics with and what type of economics to have. You need all three of them synchronized at the same time working together and that's what the African Union is asking us to get ready to do. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Corandin, Sister Q, also Mrs. Del Jones, or Mrs. Nana Abaka Kuntu. Um, 
in answering the sister's question, I will be representing myself, because I was also asked to represent Baba Dale. Um, the sister's question was, are there enough sisters in the re revelation, in revolution? Um, I don't think that we are, I think there are a lot of us here, but we are delegated to the back so that it looks like we're not here. And I think that what we have to recognize is that the revolution is not going to be successful without us coming to the front and taking an active part. Um, there has never been a revolution of any people that was successful without the women taking an active part and in some cases picking up arms. So if the sisters think that we could just sit around and let the brothers free us, it's not going to happen. Uh, electoral politics. A lot, many of us, myself included, wanted no part of it because that was the system. That's right. So we stayed out of it right. and we let ancient mamas, Uncle Toms, sellouts get in. Then we would have forums like this and diss them, and they could care less because they still got the power. And I just want to encourage you, we need revolutionaries, Pan-Africanists, running for office, and let's get inside and light the fire. Because what happens in New York City, this is a question of power. If we don't have power to do all of this stuff that we're talking about, then it's a nice conversation. But when I go back to New York City, and I'm in East New York, Brooklyn, if Donald Trump wants to buy some city-owned property in East New York, he has to come and see me. Because the city council signs off on land. So if you got power, and right now we were able to get, instead of talking about unemployment, I went and confronted the mayor and got $28 million out of our city coffers to deal with black men who are unemployed and brothers and sisters who are formerly incarcerated. So I think that we gotta put some power. Power is being in a position to act in your best interest. Persuasion, influence, is when we gotta demonstrate, holler, and scream to get somebody in power to do the right thing for us. We need to cease the time and cease the power. Hello. My name is Maddox Moore. I'm a graduate student here at Clark Atlanta University, work, getting a master's degree in May in African African American Studies in May. Now, my question to you all, to anybody on the panel, we traced our family history all the way back to Senegal, West Africa, from America to Africa. My question to anybody on the panel is, how do we tap into all those people out there in the African American community who are now tracing their histories back to Africa, but have not yet made the connection that they actually need to go back to Africa. How do we tap into all of those people? Who wants to take that? Thank you, Thanks, Thanks, First of all, one of the things that we have to realize is that as Africans, we are Africans. That's the reason why Pan-Africans came from this side. We had no ethnic connections. We didn't have any preferences to a particular group. We were Africans, and we saw ourselves in the bigger picture. You know, when George Bush the other day made a mistake by saying that the country of Africa, and everybody laughed at him, but I didn't laugh at him, because that's our design, that's our direction, that's what we want. Now, for you to start now, uh, I mean, it's up to you, but for you to believe that you have to stop now and go spend money for a DNA to find out that you're black already, you know, it doesn't make any sense. We're, not, we're trying not to go back into, uh, you know, <laughs> tribalism, <laughs> ethnic, uh, ethnic divisions, because that's why they've been able to up, uh, uproot us. So it's, it's, it's good to know what you, who you are, but in the final analysis, you're an African, and that's what we're trying to build. We're trying to get away from all this other stuff that would mean that we believe that when we hear somebody who is our group, suddenly, we take their position, and we don't take the position of what's best for the whole continent and the African people as a whole. I have an additional take 
to what Brother Elombe said. I have found that persons who have gone to the trouble, and it usually is one member in the family, it's never usually the whole family, because we never can get together on anything in, more common in my experience. One member of the family who does the DNA, and they get a brother to get the father's side. And I found that those people who have done that for one or another reason, I don't know how to explain it, those members of the family who didn't want to be African before feel more akin to being African after finding out from that sister or that brother who has taken the time, expended the money to find out where their family traces back to Africa. So it's a two-way sword. For some people it may be bad because then we become um, culturally isolated, but for others who did not want to be African in the first place in the family, sometimes it's transforming in that it gives them a connection where they never had an interest, didn't want to hear the word Africa, now because their sister or brother or cousin did this and is able to tell them, I am, I am um, Evie, I am, I am Ashanti, I am uh, Yoruba, I am Igbo, they become interested. So it can work, all right? It can work both ways. And I think we need all the different ways for it to work, for our people to have the identity, to have the, have the connection, to have the desire to do what it is that we need to do, which is to connect with our ancient ancestral forebears. Thank you. Uh, quickly, um, I'm not sure whether you should spend $300 or $400 for this process. I think that if we want to do it collectively, we need to make the government pay for it. Come on. We, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't come here on our own. If you want to do it, then there should be a petition. And you shouldn't try to wait until reparations, saying being that you kidnapped us from Africa and put us in the holes of ships, and we now collectively want to identify where we came from, then let them pay for it. Because if it's set up commercially, and a lot of people are making money on it now, then they may feed you anything. But if it's set up that the government has to pay for it, and it's not a commercial venture, then you may have more of a chance to find out where you came from. And then the last part of that, we cannot allow that to divide us, because they're always seeking ways to divide black folks so that they can rule over them, okay? I just want to mention that, thank you. Uh, I would like to add on that, as you know, Africa was just one, but we were divided, as um, the brother is just saying. You know what? There are Japanese American, and there are African American, but they speak Japanese, they speak Chinese. Do we speak just one African language? Somebody comes from the West, somebody comes from the South, somebody comes from the East, and we can't just communicate. Instead, we should be speaking one language and understanding each other. So this division, and I can just quote Peter Tosh. Peter Tosh said, no matter what you are or where you come from, you are an African. Uh, first of all, I'd like to honor the panel and uh, the organizers tonight, because it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. And we're going to be here and able to uh, ask a couple questions. But my first question is that, um, like, I had some issues. Like, uh, I had a, my son is 7 and 11, and I was at a movie theater. I was watching, I don't know if you guys saw that movie, um, What the Bleep Do We Know? And, uh, well, I had him sitting down with me watching the movie, about to watch the, watch the movie. And one of the sisters uh, tapped me on the shoulder, she looked as she came in to watch the movie. She said, well, the kids' movie is in, in the next theater. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, no, they come and see this movie. Because, you know, the, what the bleep is, I guess, a, a movie about reality or whatever. And my question really is that, how do we get the kids, the children, like, involved into the struggle early? Um, like, I see like a couple, two, three, four kids, and the struggle is going to really be in their hand. And somehow, I don't see us bringing them a part of this reality of our freedom and unity. And the question is like, how, how do we bring that about? Yeah, uh, may I just comment on that? That has to start with you. Let me, let me be hard on that piece. You know, there's a lot of pro all over this country. There's programs for the kids. 
there's hundreds if not thousands of books in the black bookstores, mostly sitting there. The children, the process of learning, where that learning can have the greatest impact is that you have to take this wisdom back to your household. And, and it's very difficult because we have given up the notion of education to somebody else. The first and most primary of all educators of the children is the parents. Every child in every household should know the map of Africa, should be able to draw it, should be able to name the 53 countries, should be able to locate it by the time they're six years old. Every child in every household there is enough DVDs and CDs out now on different African languages which you can get everywhere. I do it in my house, so like all my grandkids and my kids, once a week African language, once a week African geography. One, this is before we eat dinner. We gather around the dinner table, all my children. Every household that I have a child, six of them, has to have a shrine to ancestors. Every household. Every household have to have books that are African-centered, African image, African-focused books. And those books must have one day of the week at least to be read. The Nguzo Saba has been with us for many, many years, the seven principles of Kwanzaa. We do it once a year. We do the seven principles seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. The parents have to take a greater part of response because we who are here doing this, we are all the parents. These are our collective kids. So in our small units, we've got to understand that our primary responsibility is to form that mind. Because if we wait for it to get out here, there's so many other forces, even when you do what I say do, those forces are coming to take them away from you and will have some impact. But if you can put this education starting from the cradle, you would have a greater opportunity that those children will precede you in struggle and precede you in consciousness. This has been my criticism of the movement for decades, and we haven't done nothing about it yet. We are boring for the children. Because we don't organize anything from them. They're going to sit here and listen to us talk and fall asleep. We don't have a person on point to say, when children come, hook up something that relates to them. So that they don't have to sit in this audience Listen to us. So they're going to be coming because daddy said so, and they'll do that for a while. But the minute they get a chance to book, they're going to jack. Because we don't focus on them. We don't pay attention to them. And if we would do more of that, so that this is just a, a, as exciting as them going to another kind of event, then they would welcome, and they would be glad to come in the struggle, and we should get them involved. And in see, he even gave me a hand clap right there. I got a hand clap from his son. So. <laughs> No one's be saying something, right? But I think we gotta really focus and pay attention and make it exciting for them when they'll hang. Uh, one of the things I think that needs to happen now is to give a brother a hand for, for coming and bringing his sons. So that's how I got started. The parents, that's how my children got started. I have three sons, three daughters, and, and their whole upbringing was in the movement. And from there, we started our own school. So right now, one of the things that we Rasta women are doing is we're creating a curriculum that will be a collaboration and a uni unified plan of action of all the different curriculums that can be used in the home, that will be used in, uh, right now, they have a home school system, you know, that kind of has replaced our freedom school and independent school system. And so we have to keep those systems, we have to keep supporting those systems uh, so that our children can be in the hands of people that love, that we trust, and that nurture them. So let's give the brother a hand for bringing his sons. Uh, briefly, I, I would like to make a comment. We've been given a, the wrong concept of the future in our children. If we do not accept our responsibility, and live up to it, there will be no future for our children. See, the European has taught us the children, they are your future. But really, that's deceptive. Because my children are not my future. Because if I had not made the move I made, 
I don't know what would have happened to my son. I took him out of America when he was 12. He's now teaching school in Israel, in the Israeli schools, as well as our private school. Fluent, Hebrew speaker, very, very sharp. But if I had left him back here with his mother, who did not want to journey to Israel, which I respected, but my son, I took him with me and gave him a future. Yeah, that's real hard. Um, all right, all right. Um, I'm Dr. Oyajide Anibo. You see my sign out in the um, gallery there for the John Henry Clark Academy of Arts and Sciences, a school for boys. Um, let's see, I think I'll answer like this. I'm an old soldier, and everything that has been said today, we were saying in 1964, um, there's absolutely no new thing that has been said here. So that's a comment, I think, on all of us. As to children, we're the only people on the planet. Turn this thing loose, brother. We're the only people on the planet who send our children to our enemy to be educated. Yes. Nobody else does it. I lived in Nigeria where my father's from for 14 years. And the first thing the white missionaries do from the Sudan Interior Mission and other such places, the first thing they do is build a fence. The second thing they do is get a dog. The third thing they build is a school for their children. And then they build a church. And when their, teen, when their children get to be uh, just about teens, they send them back to white bread land to learn. On the other hand, I was a principal of a teacher training college in Islamized northern Nigeria. At that time, at the end of the year, at the end of the course, we had to send our exams to England to be corrected. Did you hear what I said? And it was like that all over West Africa. We could teach, but only the curriculum that Europeans devised for us. And guess what? We're doing it right here. I don't know if you know it or not, but your children are being taught that Egypt is in the Middle East. So now, my question to you is this. Do you want to educate your children or not? Or you just want to talk about it? If you want to educate your children, then where are the schools? Why is it you have money to buy beautiful African garbs, nice cars, Big screen television, internet, $100 tennis shoes, but you don't have a school. What, I mean, what you gonna do? What's your plan? We have been saying these exact same things since 1964 and before. So that's the answer to how do you involve the children? How do you involve the children? You involve the children. You teach your own children. Why are you sending your children to your enemy and tell him to teach what you yourself will not do? That's never going to happen. It never has happened and it never will. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and uh, I was uh, originally here because uh, I was a part of another conference. I'm a teacher uh, as well as an author from Detroit, 
And the uh, uh, topic I wanted to speak very briefly on is education. I wrote a book that was entitled Raised Wrong, Educated Worse, Addressing the Troubled Behavior of Our Sons. Mm. And the topic that the last two brothers and sisters were just talking about have concerned me because as a teacher and a community activist, someone who works in the schools, I saw all of the statistics, I saw all of the actions within the schools, and only 40% of our sons are graduating from high school, which means that we're sending them through a nine to 13 year process, and in the end, they're not even getting the piece of paper out of it that is the basic requirement to get any type of job out here in American society. And therefore, I wanted to provide teachers, activists, parents, with some concrete strategies for how to pressure those who are educating them if you absolutely just feel that you have to have them educated in the enemy schools. And also wanted to provide some direction for those who are taking the real route to self-determination and independence and building independent African-centered schools. And I'll end like this. I just wanted to say that, you know, my books and things are available. What I'm really going to be looking at doing, I hope that some of you will join me in the next two years. What we're going to try to do is build more than schools. We're going to try to build a movement, a re-energized movement to save our sons in school. Thank you. Yes, behind the panel, I want to take my time. I've been studying the teacher of the Most High Elijah Muhammad for a good decade. Now I was in the fall of America in the high state subject of destruction of American education. And um, I say under that teaching, it was talking about how the wise and the scientists need to check up on that. Because I'm going to tell you like this, I've been studying the Quran for a long time as well, and many of the prophets was not educated academically, it was more spiritually, and they became independent. And I believe academics is the withholding of our progress. And to tell you the God's truth, under the unity of states of our world corporation, I don't excuse me, I'm gonna take my time, excuse me. Under the unity of states of our world corporation, America is a corporation, and under federalism is a count of treason. Oh, excuse me. Okay, I'll, I'll apologize. Under the United States of our world corporation, which is of America, and I believe federalism is treason to the contra a constitutional contract, and I'm gonna just be honest with you, the Patriot Act also, as well as saying the black.